Alright, so carrying on the series of lesser known office theories that I started last year, today I wanted to focus on some obscure office theories having to do with some massive secrets that some of the characters are possibly keeping. Secret secrets are no fun. Secret secrets hurt someone. These theories, like all fan theories, are just fun thought experiments. I think they work out a part of our brain when we're watching a show and connecting neurons that add a new level of excitement to the series. So are these true? Don't know, super care. Does that matter? No way, Jose! I'm... Lastly, lesser known is a relative statement. If you scour the depths of the web every day, you're probably familiar with these. If not, then they're probably new. Nice. Oh, and before we begin, here's my daily reminder that Toby was not the Scranton Strangler. Well, were you, when you were writing the show and when you were acting in the show, did you ever, did that ever cross your mind? No. Not once. Now let's expose some secrets. Fair warning, spoilers ahead. I understand nothing. When you try to put Michael in a box, it gets a little complicated. Is he a jerk? Maybe Angela would cheerlead. Oh yeah, right. I'll do it. Oh, yuck, that's worse than you playing. Or is he kind? I am really proud of you. Is he a realist? I quit my job. We both quit. Those are the facts, that's what happened. Or is he fanciful? Well, that's easy for you to say. You have a bad imagination, it's stupid. I live in a fantasy world. And we could do this with a few more adjectives and their antonyms, but for the sake of the theory, let's look at just one more. Is he dumb? I declare bankruptcy! Or is he smart? So they may be looking for a little change in the CFO. So I don't think I need to wait out Dunder Mifflin. I think I just have to wait out you. And if you watched Michael through his seven seasons on the show on repeat like a lot of fans have, you begin to see some method to Michael's madness. As a boss on the surface, it's easy to just look at the surface craziness that Michael saturates the Scranton office with in each episode. Ooh, I burned my foot very badly on my foreman grill. And then conclude that Michael's an idiot. Wow, a lot of calories. Well, just don't leave it on too long. But fans are quick to point out how effective Michael actually was as a salesman. I almost had awesome blossom coming out of my nose. <laughs> but as a boss. You really suck as a ball. Well, this theory would say that Michael isn't just smart, he's actually a genius. Is he some sort of secret genius? And some evidence was right in front of our face the entire time. Your branch have been doing great lately, and your sales staff is reporting very strong numbers. Outperforming last year, in fact. So the branch always excelled, regardless of the economy. In this climate? Yeah, <laughs> in all climates. Regardless of their corporate boss, that we were the one branch that was actually working right, so we probably could have saved our own asses. We didn't need them touching our asses. So how did the branch always do so well? Because at Dunder Mifflin Scranton, we're not just in the paper business, we're in the people business. Well, logically, it's the people. The people make up the branch between customer service, quar, quabity, quabity assurance, sales, and accounting, they were a well-oiled machine that didn't rely on anyone, which is even explored in season nine. So as it turns out, unless you're a young child or a prison inmate, you don't need anyone supervising you. Come in. Andy, hi, I just made another huge sale for the company that you manage, so I need you to authorize that expense report and sign off on that contract. So how is the lack of a need for a manager evidence that Michael is a genius? Dwight, you ignorant slut. Which maybe the question we should be asking ourselves is, has Michael somehow managed the branch so well that he basically alleviated the need for any semblance of real leadership? Well, not quite, but in the words of Tupac, if you let a person talk long enough, you'll hear their true intentions. So what does Michael say about his managerial approach? Well, since season one, he spoke about how his workers are his family. And Michael's relationship first approach is presented in every season. You know, you can go mess with Josh's people, but I'm the head of this family and uh, you ain't gonna be messing with my children. Times have changed a little. And even though we're still a family here at Dunder Mifflin, families grow. My branch is absorbing the Stanford branch. Or as I like to put it, my family is doubling in size. Michael, you always said we were a family. And it's still there in his very last episode. The people that you work with are just, when you get down to it, 
your very best friends. It's also clear that Michael doesn't treat people differently based on their function. And you know why not? Because I am colorblind. And while Michael can be inappropriate for the office place at times, that's what she said, no time, but she did, no time! He does have a perfectly fine explanation for this as well. I say stuff like that, you know, to lighten the tension when things sort of get hard. That's what she said. <laughs> and also, all of this works when we break down Michael's sales approach. We get a great example of this in season two. He diffuses tension. Did somebody say baby back ribs? Baby back chili. Baby, baby, baby back ribs. He breaks down barriers. You can take care of her. Whew. Well, this brings us to Jan. Truth or dare? Tell us about your divorce. He relates with his clients. How many hospitals we have, or how many schools we have. It's home, you know? I know the challenges of this. And he makes the deal. I guess I could give you guys our business, but. You have to meet me halfway, okay? Because they're expecting me to make cuts. So how does Michael lead by not leading? I see. Listen, why why don't we just leave that position vacant? Truth be told, I think I thrive under a lack of accountability. It's almost as though Michael creates an environment that through his insanity, he empowers his workers to take responsibility for their own workload, and in that way, they get stuff done. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> yeah. So I want to hear in the comments, do you think that Michael is a genius? <laughs> Sometimes I say crazy things. <laughs> but Michael isn't the only one that's theorized to be a genius. Oh. My name is Kevin. Yeah. That is my name. Yeah. They call me Kevin. Yeah. Because that's my name. Roll For fans of my channel, it's no surprise that Kevin is one of my favorite characters. I just want to lie on the beach and eat hot dogs. That's all I've ever wanted. One of three accountants in the Scranton branch, Kevin's necessity and presence is an ongoing joke throughout the series. Well, I looked through all the budgets, and there is one department. Yes. That has three people. Yeah doing the work that could be done by two. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Kevin is much beloved by most Office fans as the dull-witted numbers guy. I do the numbers. With Kevin becoming more and more of a character of himself every episode. Oh. Don't be a caricature, Kevin. Never be a caricature. With Holly, the new HR rep, even easily being conned. I think it's really cool you hired Kevin. Thanks. It's hard to fathom anything real happening under the surface here, but let's look at the evidence. This theory points out that Kevin gradually de-evolved throughout the series. To make the point, here's Kevin's first line spoken in the show. I bet it's gonna be me, probably gonna be me. Yeah, it'll be you. And here's Kevin in the season nine premiere. The turtle was already dead. Probably when I ran over him, the first time. And the show even references this decline in this meta moment. Me feel good, body strong, sleep big last night. No, oh, he, guys. He's, fine. he's fine. He's always been like that. No, he hasn't. I mean, he's gotten worse over the years. But... It's hard to really pinpoint at what point Kevin became Kevin. Hey. But on my channel, I'm reviewing every single episode of The Office in quite a lot of detail, and I'd say that if this theory is to be believed, if Kevin is really just pretending to be Kevin... You can't eat cats, Kevin. Then the answer to that question, we need to talk about what his motives for doing this are in the first place. The first theory is that Kevin is pretending to be slow because he knows that it'll make him more of an interesting character and thus give him more screen time in the documentary. And this theory kind of tracks. When you look generally at season one, when Kevin is quote normal, he's just a background character with little to nothing to do work-wise and in the documentary. Maybe some spaghetti. Okay, Kevin, you can take off that thing, okay? By the end of the doc crew's time in Scranton, he gets a substantial amount of screen time in every episode. What are you doing? wanted to eat a pig in a blanket, in a blanket. So if Kevin is putting on a facade to make for a more engaging documentary subject, then I'd say this all started in season two's Office Olympics. 
in which Kevin can barely contain his smile and giggles as the dock crew gives him a tight shot as he, perhaps on purpose, is using the wrong hand during the national anthem. This Pavlov's dog reward moment gives Kevin all of the ammunition he may need to increasingly become more of an engaging character. It's not Ashton Kutcher, it's Kevin Malone. Kevin, then, is just a character that this guy puts on to get more screen time. And this theory kind of works with Andy, too. You even look shorter. Oh, I took out my lips. Oh. Yeah, unlike Andy Bernard, this character is my real height. Hmm. But the other motive that Kevin may have is that he's actually embezzling money from the company. Gasp. Right, so we think of Kevin as a big, harmless pillow. Equally handsome, equally smart. This theory would suggest that's exactly what he wants you to think. Just a bumbling fool who could never pull off a con right in front of our faces. But let's break this down. We know that Kevin has a gambling problem. That's a real thing. Yeah, but no one here has it. Someone has it. This means that he'll either be in a position of deficit, like in the Kevin's Loan webisode. That little dude may hurt me if I don't get that bank loan or he's always on the prowl for his next risk-reward situation to take some sweet, sweet cash. And that is Dallas. And we know that he's more than willing to steal some money from Dunder Mifflin from Petty Cash. I'm gonna take this Petty Cash that I got from Oscar and turn it into next month's rent. Well, I don't think this next joke was written to make us believe something nefarious was happening, I think that it could be open to interpretation. I had Martin explain to me three times what he got arrested for. It sounds an awful lot like what I do here every day. And you might think, well, Kevin isn't smart enough to pull this all off. But from time to time, some intelligence ends up slipping through the cracks. I won the 2002 $2,500 No Limit Deuce to Seven Draw Tournament at the World Series of Poker in Vegas. 13 miles away. So at 55 miles an hour, that just gives us five minutes to spare. With poker and pie, Kevin seems to have no problem counting. So what's his end game? Well, we find out in the finale that Kevin was fired. He bought a bar. You heard you bought a bar, Kevin? Yes, I did. This one. An entire bar. Who knows how much he'd spend on that, but to go from having nothing to owning a bar means that there was plenty going on in the background that we never saw in the series. Keep in mind that Kevin did use a special accounting trick to keep the books. He used to call it a Kalevin. He told Dwight, a mistake plus Kalevin gets you home by seven. And while that may be why the Scranton branch always ended up performing the best in the company, it could have been Kevin's way of embezzling that money. I am going to be a very rich dude. Or there was a completely different reason why the Scranton branch was always on top. Why is PBS sending another crew? We're getting bonus footage for the DVD. Okay, this one is pretty straightforward and seeks to answer a very specific plot point that is present throughout most of the series. And that is Scranton branch's apparent success in spite of the economy and in spite of itself a product that nobody wanted. This theory posits that the documentary crew filming all of the craziness decided that they had struck proverbial gold with finding incredible documentary subjects. The quirkiness, the drama, the mundanity, all of it. The producers surely knew that there would be gold in them hills and began to purchase paper from Dunder Mifflin Scranton anonymously as to not interfere directly with their subjects. When are you gonna boom me? Uh, listen, they're cracking down on us talking to the subjects. It's, it's a lame rule, but you know, I wanna, I, I'll, I'll see you later. Got it. The logistics involved in this, the money it took, would have all made a worthy profit for everyone involved. And you are going to have to explain to them why your most profitable branch is bleeding. What about the fact that the doc aired on the not-for-profit PBS network? PBS, the propaganda wing of Bill and Melinda Gates and viewers like you. You go to the bathroom for 45 minutes and everything changes. Right, not much money in it there, unless PBS procured the rights from the original production company for a hefty fee. And perhaps the documentary company could then sell the rights to the American workplace to another network. I don't mean to demean PBS, but I can't imagine a locally aired PBS documentary could actually incur this much stardom. Hey, it's Andy Bernard. Bernard. Oh, 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 
Maybe it would, I don't know. But that's just what this theory suggests, that the dock crew secretly kept the branch afloat. And speaking of floating. His name, Creed Breath. Before this last theory, if you could give this video a like, that would be awesome. It helps a ton. If you don't, screw you, Texas Poon Tappa. Anyway, I've said this before on this channel, if The Office was a recipe, Creed Bratton is a certain spice that we get just the right amount of. Too little Creed, and something's missing. What is it then? Hey guys, somebody making soup? Too much Creed, and you might spoil the dish. <coughs> I'm sorry. For sure, someone will argue with me about that in the comments, but the point is that the character of Creed is the phrase non sequitur in human form. Do that, I'm gonna do that. If you do that, I'm gonna do that. You do this, I'm gonna do that. Once you see him presented on camera and he begins to open his mouth, well, we don't exactly know what he's gonna say or what he'll do. Maybe he'll drop some knowledge. I love my kids, I love real estate, I love ceramics, I love my job, I, I love wrestling. Maybe he'll nail a cartwheel. I did it! You did? The perfect cartwheel. And you may think that his backstory isn't fully explored until the final episode. Creed was in the band The Grassroots in the 1960s. During that time, the police say he sold drugs and trafficked in endangered species meat. But it was, several times throughout the series. Back in the 60s, I was with The Grassroots. We toured with uh, Janis Joplin, The Doors, Cream. They were simply deleted from the final cut, seemingly to make the character more elusive. But we even get this moment in season four when Creed shows off his ID, in which it shows a completely different name, which this is Creed Bratton's actual birth name, which means that Creed Bratton is actually an alias in real life and in the show. The last person to do this disappeared. His name, Creed Bratton. But for totally different reasons, and I'm kind of confused just saying that sentence. The timeline's messy. Anyway, I explored Creed a little bit in the office horror video I made, but Creed's been shown to traffic animals, be involved in cults, and potentially murder. There has been a murder, and you are a suspect. So it's obvious that there's a lot of secretivity around this character's backstory, but those theories about it are abundant. Some argue that Creed is the Scranton Strangler which would definitely be more believable than this guy. No more s'mores. No more s'mores. <laughs> hey, nobody cares. Because this dude, he's killed people. It's Halloween. That is really, really good timing. But strangling someone doesn't produce that much blood. At least, I, I would assume. I don't know, guys. And there is a plot element that the writers have talked about, but they never really stated in the show that the strangler wasn't actually strangling people to death just gripping them till their life bar was about empty, then letting off, which might even be more messed up, I'm not sure. Great heroin though. But I guess I could see Creed as that type of creep. Sometimes it's best just to stay out of it. That's true, that's right, yeah. Wanna play a game? One more theory suggests that when Creed says this, nobody steals from Creed Bratton and gets away with it. Creed Bratton went on a quest to hunt down and destroy the culprits, John Wick style. They're real casual, like, not to make a big deal out of it, but I know everybody saw it. Other fan theories suggest that Creed's erratic behavior is partly due to his elderly dementia. Creed Bratton, 75 plus division. You're over 75 years old? 82 November 1st. How much is the prize money? There's no prize money. But is any of this real? I'm 30. Well, in November I'll be 30. Another fan theory hypothesizes that Creed's simply pretending to be bizarre due to the fact that he's literally hiding from the law in plain sight. Just pretend like we're talking until the cops leave. Hoping to use the evidence gathered by the dock crew as a legal defense to why he's not able to stand trial due to mental instability. As I like to call it, Great Bratton. Keep it running. Then there's the simple yet delightful idea that Creed is biding his time to get to Scotland and hunt down Nessie. Why don't you tell Stanley that I have asthma? Because I don't. If it gets out, they won't let me scuba. If I can't scuba, then what's this all been about? What am I working toward? The Loch Ness Monster and the reward for its capture? All the riches in Scotland. So I have one question. Why are you here? And then lastly, the creed is somehow mixed up with organized crime. 
and that somehow he's still operating under that alias, printing illegal IDs, pretending to work a mild-mannered job, though he's never actually working. Quar, quar. And I do like that last one, but I like the theory more that Bob Vance is secretly a mobster. I feel like there's more weight in the evidence for that. Who's Bob Vance? You have a lot to learn about this town, sweetie. But maybe the most suspicious moment for Bob Vance is all the cash he threw in to make Toby's goodbye party a smashing success. That's like what, five grand to rent a Ferris wheel? I mean, they had to spend over 10K on this party. I'm pretty sure the refrigeration business was doing well in 08. Thanks, I never owned a refrigerator. But it seems like a suspicious amount of cash to be throwing around for something so trivial. What are you hiding, Bob? Was Bob Vance the Scranton Strangler? Oh, no, of course not. Okay. No, 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 okay. Bob, Bob's a United States Marine Corps infantry combat officer from Vietnam. Of course, which in some circles may have qualified him, but, um, you know, no, no, no. A Marine, all, always, one, once and forever. Yeah, Robert Schaefer told me that his view of the character was pretty straight-laced, so I guess he's not hiding so much. He just loves his wife. So that's what I have for lesser-known office theories on character secrets. Let me know in the comments what you think about these secrets or what your favorite office theory is that at least has some evidence to it. If you drop something awesome and I end up using it for a future video, I'll make sure to call it out. If you love The Office like I do, please check out the rest of my channel. I'm reviewing every episode once a week with a lot of details, some edits. I am in And a look at each episode's deeper meaning. Thanks. Follow us on our social media, the Discord. And if you really want to support the channel, check out our memberships or the Patreon. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.